Hey Leslie, let's talk about some brain health. Take it away. Sounds good. Thank you, Austin. I'm Leslie Blanche and I'm the Family Consumer Science Educator for University of Idaho Extension here in Bonneville County. So we're out here enjoying the beautiful community park, getting some fresh air and sunshine, and I encourage you all to do that today as well. Today's topic is brain health, protecting your cognitive assets, cognitive meaning mental. So in introduction, I just want to talk about some age-related cognitive changes. One is cognitive decline, and we'll prob all, probably all experience that. That's just that typical age-related memory loss. That person would still score normal on a medical memory test, uh, but just, you know, forgetting things like we all do at times as we get older especially. The next level would be mild cognitive decline, and that person is going to score a little lower on the memory test, maybe below normal, but it's still not going to affect their what we call ADLs, activities of daily living. They're still driving, cooking, dressing, functioning pretty, pretty normally, just a little more forgetful. Dementia, on the other hand, the person with that condition is going to score definitely low on the cognitive tests, which include memory and other mental functions, but their uh, mental or cognitive health now has affected their daily living, um, really inhibiting just those basic self-care and things like that to different degrees. The most common dementia is Alzheimer's disease. So we're going to be looking at kind of things we can do in our lifestyle to help mitigate all of these, that normal aging memory decline all the way to hopefully minimizing our risk of Alzheimer's. Statistics, current statistics in the United States are that one in five women will at some point in their life develop Alzheimer's. Maybe that's not till they're 99. But at some point, one in five women will develop a degree of Alzheimer's, one in 10 men. Not sure why there's that genetic or uh, sex difference, gender difference, but those are the current statistics. So you might think, Leslie, that's pretty discouraging. That's kind of uh, daunting. And it can be, but we're going to focus on the positive things we can do to change those statistics. Let's not be one of those statistics. Lifestyle modification. And just remember what is good for the heart is good for the brain. And one of those modifications is our diet. So we're going to be talking about diet today. And I have a folder here with me that I'll be referring to some different sheets that I can actually email you um, later today or next week and we'll talk about that at the end. So many of you have probably heard about the Mediterranean diet. Um, it's not what we would call a fad diet, it's actually very scientifically based. But researchers have found that that pattern of eating, Greece, Italy, Spain, those countries along the Mediterranean, they have fewer heart disease, they have lower rates of dementia and Alzheimer's, and what, it is, what is it about that diet that might be influencing that? One of the things is olives, of course, are in abundance in that part of the world, and they use a lot of olive oil as their primary uh, cooking oil. That can be part of it. Red grapes, which um, those countries use a lot of wine. You don't have to have the red grapes in the form of wine to get those nutrients. Reversitol, reversitrol, if I can pronounce it correctly, are in the grapes themselves. So eating those dark red and purple grapes can help. We also see that those countries eat a lot of fish. They're on the Mediterranean Sea. So more fish, more fatty fish, more omega-3 fatty acids. You probably have heard of those omega-3 fatty acids. They are high in uh, fatty fish such as salmon, trout. It's, it's going to come in summer in Idaho someday. I know it's a little chilly today, but the sun feels good. So trout is a great source of omega-3s, tuna, particularly albacore, and then fish that's not too common in the West, like herring and mackerel, but I understand they eat that on the East Coast. So keep that in mind. A couple servings of fish a day. Uh, more nuts and legumes, so a little less on the red meat. Uh, they don't totally avoid beef and pork, but it's a small, small part of their diet, maybe once a week. More on the fish, nuts, legumes, legumes, bean beans, and split peas, lentils in that uh, Mediterranean diet. And again, I do have a handout on that. DASH diet. If any of you have heard of that, maybe from a cardiologist or um, in the news, it stands for Dietary Approaches 
to stopping hypertension. So remember at the beginning of today's presentation, I said what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So the DASH diet is geared toward heart health, cardiac health, particularly hypertension, but they found that, gee, eating that way tends to lower that risk of dementia and Alzheimer's. DASH diet is very, very similar to Mediterranean diet in that we're going to be decreasing the amount of red meat, avoiding processed meats, increasing those fatty fish. They're not only heart healthy, but brain healthy as well. More nuts and legumes. Emphasis on whole grains in both diets. Uh, the DASH diet does include some dairy, low-fat dairy, whereas the Mediterranean diet, that's just not part of their diet traditionally, uh, dairy as much. So there's a combination called the MIND diet, and I'm going to read this because it's a big, long title. So MIND, Mediterranean DASH, so it's a combination of those two diets, Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. So try to say that 10 times fast. All you need to remember is the MIND diet. Again, they've found that aspects of both Mediterranean and DASH are very healthy for the brain. MIND basics for that diet, fish at least once a week. The Mediterraneans are probably going to be eating that quite a bit more, three to four times a week. At least six servings of green leafy vegetables a week, or yes, a week. So that's not a day. That's uh, maybe one cup of green leafies a day more the better, but at least one cup a day, and using olive oil as your primary oil. So I do encourage people to get the extra virgin and also first press. It's just less processed, closer to the natural olive. Fats we've already touched on, increasing those omega-3 fatty acids. We talked about the fatty fish, maybe even getting 12 ounces a week. That's just three four ounce servings, about the size of the palm of my hand, or a deck of cards, a little larger than a deck of cards. So three times a week, that fatty fish. Walnuts are a great source of uh, plant-based omega-3 fatty acids, are, as are flaxseed. So flaxseed comes whole, and if you want to use it for fiber, digestive purposes, sprinkle it in your oatmeal or in a smoothie and, and have it whole. That uh, little husk or hull adds that roughage, as my mother would say, to help clean out our digestive system, keep us normal. If you want to release the omega-3 fatty acids in that flax seed, then grind it and put that in your cereal or smoothie or however you choose to do it. So maybe some of both, some whole flax, some ground flax. Um, just by changing, decreasing the saturated animal fat, avoiding those trans fats like stick margarine, and increasing those heart healthy omega-3s can decrease that dementia, Alzheimer's risk by a great 50%. So that's pretty significant. Polyphenol is another big word. It's a group of antioxidants that are found only in plant foods. And these polyphenols can decrease oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is something that happens to our cells. Um, uh, it's a normal process, but we don't want a lot of it. So that's when you probably heard of antioxidants in fruits and vegetables. We want to eat plenty of those to kind of combat that natural process that it doesn't go overboard. The oxidative stress can cause inflammation. We're seeing inflammation branching off into lots of chronic conditions, not only brain conditions such as Alzheimer's, but cardiac and diabetes as well. So we want to keep that chronic inflammation at bay. Polyphenols can do that. What are some sources? Fruit, particularly the purple, blue, red category. So think blueberries. If you've heard that blueberries are good for your health, they are. But they're not the only berries. All berries are good for your health particularly cranberries and blueberries in this way. Um, and again, those red and, and black and purple grapes. Nuts, all nuts are gonna have a good fatty acid profile and these polyphenols. Oh, okay, I've, Austin is telling me I'm blocking my little speaker here, sorry folks. Technology is not my first forte, but anyway, hope you can hear me now. So. We've got polyphenols from fruits such as berries, blue, red, purple berries, including grapes. Nuts, all nuts are great. You might hear, walnuts are really healthy for you. Yes, they are. 
They have a lot of these polyphenols. They have a lot of those omega-3 fatty acids, but so do pistachios and pecans. So get a mix of nuts and then tea, such as green tea can provide you some polyphenols as well. Weight management. They are seeing, when I say they, these are researchers. So we like to prevent ev present evidence-based research through extension, University of Idaho. So they, researchers, have linked excess body weight with also increased inflammation, which then can contribute to heart disease, diabetes, but also dementia, or that decreased cognitive ability. So we want to remember diet, and I'm just gonna erase this. Diet, more fish, more olive oil, more fruits and vegetables, especially those purple, red, blue fruits and those green leafy vegetables. And you can select a variety of oils to cook with, but maybe make your primary oil olive oil. Point number two is going to be exercise, so physical activity. If you're taking notes, you might want to just write down these bullet points. Physical activity, and this presentation today is being done complimentary of Apple Athletic Club and that who is who is providing this filming today. And obviously, Apple Athletic Club promotes physical exercise. Physical exercise does not have to be indoors. I know right now we're kind of in a shelter at home, except we can be outside in the fresh air, yay. So get out when it's sunshiny. You're not only going to um, benefit your heart, and lungs and brain from that physical exercise, you're gonna be boosting your immune system too. And we'll touch a little bit on immunities at the end. So physical exercise, what does that evidence-based research say? It says people who engage in aerobic fitness, so that heart pumping fitness on a regular basis, have stronger overall brain function. Even those who may have been sedentary in their younger life, as seniors, they're thinking, you know, I want to take better care of myself, and they start to exercise. That heart pumping exercise, researchers still see much, much improvement in that cognitive or mental function. But not only heart pumping, muscular strength. So think weightlifting, resistance bands, other forms, your own body weight, squats, push ups, and those can be wall push ups as well. Muscular strength. Stronger muscles, stronger neuron functioning. So direct correlation with that brain health. APOE4 carriers, you might be familiar with that, maybe not, are people who are genetically predisposed to Alzheimer's. So if you have someone in your heritage that has Alzheimer's, you might want to get tested. Um, maybe you don't want to know. But the good news is, even those who carry that gene, exercise can help offset that genetic predisposition to dementia and Alzheimer's. So lots of good reasons to exercise. When you combine that healthy diet, that Mediterranean or DASH diet or combination mind diet with exercise, you've just exponentially multiplied the benefits of diet alone or exercise alone. So sometimes as a dietitian, people will ask me, well, what is more important, your diet or your exercise, whether they're talking about blood sugar, heart, health, etc. And I can't give an answer. They both work together. So one is not more important than the other. They're both just very, very important. So even if you already have, or someone you know already has that mild cognitive decline, um, they're just, you know, they're still functioning on a daily basis, but they really are not remembering things well. Exercise can help reverse that to some degree. So it's never too late to start exercising. All right. Um, just real quickly, guidelines from the American Exercise Association, 150 minutes of that heart pumping exercise a week. You don't have to start there. Maybe five or 10 minutes, a couple days a week is where you want to start if you're not used to exercising. Walking is a wonderful place to start. Um, things like treadmills, exercise bicycles, etc. This beautiful community park. Um, you know, of course, Apple Athletic Club, once we open again, is a wonderful place to come and exercise as well. So aerobic exercise, goal, your goal to work toward 150 minutes a week or more. 
Uh, strength training, don't forget, stronger muscles, stronger brain, stronger memory. So a couple, two, three times a week. Um, right now, if you are sequestering in your home, maybe look up some YouTube videos, check out the Apple Facebook. We're doing lots of live streaming over a variety of classes. So you can kind of get familiar if you're not already familiar with what the Apple has to offer or be able to do these things from your home um, during this sequestering time. Coordinated movement. So just think, I'm going to march here, and you can do this with me at home. All of a sudden, I'm just lifting one arm. My brain has to kind of think because I'm just, I'm doing two things with my legs and only one with my arm. Now I'm going to change that and alternate my arms. Now I've got to think a little more. Any kind of coordinated movement, even just tapping one foot. I'm not sitting down, but if you're tapping, you could tap your toe and lift your heel, same time. So heel, toe, heel, toe. Little things like that you can do while you're watching TV, while you're waiting at a stoplight. You are exercising your mind. And that brings me to our next point. Not only physical exercise, but mental exercise is going to help keep that brain young and healthy. So mental exercise. When you're physically exercising, especially coordinated movement like aerobic dance um, or dance, ballroom dance, you've got to really think about the, that box step or that swing. That is mental exercise combined with physical and that's doubly good, but you can also do other mental exercises. You're probably thinking at home, yeah, Sudoku, crossword puzzles, word searches. And I have a little word search in my packet that I'll be happy to attach an email to you that has all to do with brain health, but you are doing brain health when you're doing that word search. Another fun thing to do, you can do this verbally with, um, with a friend or in a group, is what's called double trouble. And it's making a compound word. So if I throw out the word dog, and maybe someone says house, or uh, dog run, I don't know if that's a compound word. Uh, let me throw out another word that's easier, sun. Sunrise, sunset, sun dog, someone told me. I said, what is a sun dog? It has something to do with a rainbow. So you kind of get the idea. Throw out a word and make as many compound words as you can, or you can even just practice that with yourself. But it's making that mind exercise. Okie doke. I'm going to press on here. So mental activity, physical activity, when you combine those, excuse me, when you combine those, it's even better. Uh, one more thing I want to talk about. I'm glad I have my notes. I would have forgotten. There's something called neurobic exercise. So we've talked about aerobic exercise, heart pumping exercise, like these people are doing while they are all these people in the park here are doing while they're walking. But there's something an author calls neurobic exercises, and they're just mental exercises to keep those neurons strong. It's a fun little book. Um, you can Google it. It's called Keep Your Brain Alive. But some examples of mental exercises they give in here are doing things like brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand, trying to do non-routine things driving a different route to the grocery store or to work or to your uh, friend's house or relative's house. I know we're not doing that much right now, but anything you can do to get out of your routine. If you always get dressed and then eat breakfast, maybe sometimes eat breakfast then get dressed. It just makes your mind kind of wake up. So little simple things. It's a fun little book if you want to look into that. All right, diet. Very important how we eat. Physical and mental exercise very important, but sleep is also very important. We're going to get into four S's. The first one is sleep. Research shows that those who chronically get less than six hours of sleep a night are much, much more susceptible uh, to getting Alzheimer's. In fact, the rate is double. You might wonder, why is that? What's the science behind that? There are some little things in our brain called amyloid, beta amyloid deposits, and those are normal. That's just part of our system, and then our spinal fluid cleans that out to a certain degree while we're sleeping. Well, what happens if we're not giving our body enough time to clean that out, if we're not giving it enough time to sleep? Those beta amyloid deposits become plaque, and you've heard of arterial plaque cholesterol and fatty deposits on your arteries that make them not function as well. 
these amyloid, beta amyloid plaques develop kind of a tangle and a toughening in the brain. And when researchers on Alzheimer's disease have done autopsies on folks who have had Alzheimer's, they find that those brains unfortunately have a lot of amyloid plaque. So one way we can decrease that, keep that cleared out, is get adequate sleep. Um, I'm a big proponent of sleep because not only is that when your immune system works the hardest, which we need right now in our current circumstances, but that's when so many things are happening in a cleansing way in your body. And one of those is to decrease that amyloid uh, deposit in the brain. So at least seven of hours of sleep a night, more is better. But that's my personal opinion <laughs> because my body needs a lot of sleep. So you might think, gosh, that's a lot of sleep, seven hours. Try it. Try it. Because even if you feel somewhat refreshed on five or six hours of sleep, your body hasn't really had time to do the work it needs to do during sleep. Um, sleep apnea, if any of you folks are familiar with that, it's when you're, you kind of stop breathing when you're sleeping and then you gasp and get that air again. During that time that you're not breathing, your brain isn't getting oxygen. So folks with sleep apnea have a higher risk of dementia and Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is just one form of dementia. Um, as do people with insomnia, restless leg syndrome, anything that disrupts your sleep. So you might, if that is a condition you suspect you have, please get that checked out medically and they can be treated. Um, and you'll be doing not only your daily body, your body and mind will feel better each day when those things are treated, but long term, you're gonna be doing your mental cognitive health a favor as well. Uh, some of you might say, well, I have trouble getting to sleep, or I wake up in the night and then I can't get back to sleep. There are lots of simple things you can do, and again, I have a handout on this. Something I like to do is just count backward from 100. I have a very busy mind. I usually start planning my work day in the middle of the night, and so, gee, maybe I should count that as work time. I don't know. Anyway, um, so even last night, I had to start counting backward for, uh, from 100. But it helps. It really helps. Another thing you could do is a body scan where you're just kind of telling your eyes to relax, your neck, your body to sink into that mattress, just sort of going down your body, mentally telling each of those muscles to relax. That is very helpful for a lot of folks. Deep breathing and um, teach some yoga at the Apple and other places. And deep breathing is part of yoga. It's part of a lot of exercise, but it's also very great for inducing sleep. So just simply breathing in through your nose to a count of four very slowly and out through your mouth to a count of four. And you can Google different deep breathing techniques. There are lots of them out there and if you're interested and I can send you a handout on that as well. So that deep breathing is going to help induce sleep but maybe you also need to de-stress. That's another S we're going to talk about is stress. Right now is a stressful time in our country, in our world. A lot of us who maybe don't even suffer from clinical anxiety are experiencing some, are experiencing some anxiety and stress. So what can we do to minimize that stress? Deep breathing, make sure we're getting adequate sleep, but you know what? All of these can help minimize stress, a healthier body, healthier mind. What does stress have to do with Alzheimer's? I'm trying to find my notes here. Here we go. Chronic stress, and I'm just going to quote this, causes malfunction in brain pathways. So chronic stress. We have that fight or flight response, but we're not created to live like that all the time. And in our society, we tend to do that. And right now, we've got a lot of low underlying stress. So that chronic stress can cause malfunction in the brain pathways. It literally damages the brain cells, the health of the cells. Also that cortisol or hormone that helps us with fight or flight, when it's constantly on, it does damage as well. Decreases that mind function over time. So any activity for you that releases stress, Taking a nap is a great one for me. I wake up, I feel mentally and physically refreshed and then can deal with whatever I'm facing that day. Um, maybe some of that deep breathing. Any activity you enjoy, journaling, a craft, a hobby, uh, visiting with friends, which we can do right now during FaceTime and, and all those fun things, Skype. 
So any way you can de-stress is going to help that brain health. Just a couple more things. Substance usage. Research shows that both cigarette smoking or nicotine and alcohol can be damaging to the brain. If you think about it, when we're smoking and then we um, maybe develop some lung issues, we're decreasing the oxygen to the brain. So that could be a contributor to forms of dementia. Um, binge drinking and alcohol, I'm sorry, in midlife triples the risk of dementia later in life. I don't know why it's specifically midlife. That was a study that was done. But those who indulge in some binge drinking at least once a month in midlife, they're finding, hey, those people have a higher risk of Alzheimer's later in life. So the recommendations from the medical professionals are smoking cessation and avoiding or at least limiting alcohol. Uh, limiting could be two drinks a day for a man, one drink a day for a woman. Um, but if you can choose to avoiding those altogether, that can be very beneficial. So I'm not going to write this down. We have sleep, stress, substance uses was our third S. Our fourth S is socialization. Socializing actually helps our mental function. You think a lot of folks, once they retire, they kind of retire into their home. And that can be very harmful, not only emotionally, but literally mentally um, with their brain function. So trying to encourage people of all ages childhood on up to grandma and grandpa to be with people and that's going to vary for each person some of us like a lot of alone time but we still need people time too so right now i realize you're limited in socialization get on the phone get on facetime skype um writing letters maybe we can bring back that old-fashioned writing letters it's a, a different way of communicating and i'm just going to ask how much time i have austin okay all right, so we have talked about eating more fish, using olive oil, eating more fruits and vegetables in general, and choosing whole grains. Maybe a little less red meat, avoiding that processed meat. Good for the heart, good for the brain. Physical activity, both heart pumping and muscular strength. We want to bring that into our lives, whether it's three or four days a week or some every day. Mental exercises. Don't forget those crossword puzzles and word searches. You no, know, we did those as a kid. There are lots of things out there. Um, my mind just went blank because I jumped down to stress. I'm thinking of those adult coloring books. Some people find that very soothing. That can be both mental exercise and a stress relief. Any kind of mental exercise you can do, remember just brushing your teeth with the opposite hand. Sometimes I think, I don't know if I'm brushing my teeth very thoroughly, so maybe I'll do it with my right hand first, then my left for the brain activity. Get that sleep, at least seven hours a night. And if you're able to get some naps in, that's gonna boost your immune system, especially right now we need that. Stress, stress not only affects that brain in a negative way, uh, in the short term, when you're stressed, you might have brain fog, or you think, I just can't, I can't process things right now because I'm stressed. But that long-term brain cell damage, stress also suppresses our immune system. So please try to think of things you can do that are enjoyable and relaxing, trying to stay positive. Um, a positive attitude sends out different chemicals in our bodies that can be helpful, not only for brain health, but for that immune system as well. Getting outside, little sunshine, vitamin D. Uh, talking about our immune system, lots of studies show that vitamin D can help boost our immune system. We live in a northern latitude, and of course we haven't had much sun this season, but we're getting there. So you may want to even talk to your healthcare provider about possibly vitamin D supplementation. That's gonna be individual, so talk with your health provider on that. And don't stress. So what I'd like to ask of you folks, I usually like to make my presentations a discussion format, and we're a little limited on that today. And I realize you may have some questions or comments you want to share with me. So please, please email me at L, my first initial, L Blanche, B-L-A-N-C-H, at uidaho.edu. So I will be looking for those emails to come in. I've already scanned all my handouts. I'm ready to attach them, send them to you. There's some fun mind games and a lot of what I've said in writing, um, some good sleep hygiene suggestions that maybe help you get that better night's sleep. So please contact me 
questions, comments, things you would like to share. Also, if you would include maybe one new thing you learned today or something you intend to put into practice, that would be encouraging to me and we like to see what kind of impact are we making um, both from the Apple Athletic Club and University of Idaho Extension. How are we helping people? So we'd love your feedback. And with that, I'll say have a wonderful day, eat well, move more, sleep more, but don't stress. Thank you.